Good morning. Welcome to Ridgeview Church. We're so glad you guys decided to be with us this morning. Uh, we'll be together for about an hour. I'll be leading worship for you. My name's Cameron. And uh, man, we're, we're really grateful that we get to do this together this morning and worship God. Uh, some of the men here were, are fresh off a, a men's summit. So if you see some tired looking dudes, uh, it's, it's probably men's ever there. But we did have a great time. It was a really encouraging time, full of energy. Um, and so we're going to continue where we left off, uh, praising God for who he is and what he does uh, in our lives. And so will you guys stand with us? Uh, we're going we're gonna to worship this morning. Oh Christ, crucified 
crucified and raised to life he's coming back again amen
we're worshiping a God who, who knew we'd be here uh, before we did, uh, gathered together this morning. And I don't know what you're carrying in your hearts uh, this morning, but uh, I just hope to remind you as we worship him that he, he truly cares for you. And he, uh, he promises that as we cast our cares on, on him like, because he cares for us. And so I challenge you this morning to really focus on that as we dig into his word in just a few minutes, uh, as we sing praise to him. Refocus, give him your attention. That's why we're here this morning to really uh, come close and draw in. And so I, I pray that he would, he would speak to us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time. We pray that you'd speak to our hearts this morning. Lord, we give you our full attention, our full praise. We give you everything that we have. Would you take it and mold us and, and cleanse us from the inside out? In your name we pray. Amen.
you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good Amen. let's pray father as we dig into your word right now would you speak to our hearts give us ears to hear you this morning we thank you for your presence here in this place in your name we pray amen you guys can be seated good morning everybody Good morning. I thought this was Time Change Sunday for a second there. We're so glad you guys have decided to uh, join us this morning here at Ridgeview Church. My name is Alex Barrett. I'm the, the lead pastor and um, trying not to break microphones up here. Uh, usually I'm giving the sermon, but today we're going to get the opportunity to hear from a guest speaker I'm going to introduce uh, in a moment. Uh, a group of us men from Ridgeview joined uh, other men from our network churches and we're just at the point where we're trying to sing enough that we still have a voice, but the raspiness is just right there. Uh, you can hear it. And uh, so we're so glad uh, that we were able to do that this weekend. I just appreciate all of the, the prayers and uh, even for the families that were left uh, just to free up the men to be able to go. It was a great time uh, together. In our first service, uh, we had some special guests from Hope Church who came to our first service before they, they fly out. And um, we were able to, to welcome them. And we also have some special guests uh, with us today that I want to introduce to you. And so we have the Connection Ministry from Bonn, Germany. If you guys can wave your hand there and, yeah. They didn't know I was going to do that. So I always like to look at their faces that you can't see. Um, so if you get a chance after the service, um, I, I encourage you to introduce yourself to them. Uh, these are uh, dear people to us that we partner with in ministry, and they're reaching college students uh, in Europe, uh, trying to bring the hope of Jesus uh, to a dark place that we see, you know, really throughout the world, people longing uh, for hope that they're in the darkness. And uh, we've partnered with their ministry for many years. And all of you who contributed to our Christmas offering, uh, we actually gave a portion of those proceeds that we raised above and beyond the regular giving to Ridgeview uh, to give to the ministry of uh, Connection Church. And so uh, these are, are dear people to us. I encourage you to, again, to, to introduce yourself to them. And uh, we're so glad you guys have decided uh, to join us. Um, I wanted to uh, brought, draw your attention to a few things as you kind of sit and get calibrated, and singing uh, helps us really get our, our focus uh, on God, and we hope that this next hour of your life will uh, be a blessing to you, that you'll really sense God speaking to you uh, specifically. Uh, one of the things that we want to do as a church is we want to be faithful uh, to help you. Um, we exist to help you grow. That's part of why we're here. We want to gather, not just to gather and sing, but to gather to focus and then ask God, like, how can we keep moving forward and take our next step? And so uh, the first next step you can take is just fill out this connection card. If, if you're a first or second time guest, uh, we love our guests. We want to make you feel welcome. And one of the ways that we can do that is just by knowing how to serve you, knowing how to pray for you, and, and even just being able to connect with you. And so uh, fill out this connection card. If you've never filled one out, fill as much information that you feel comfortable sharing with us. And later in the service, we're going to receive our offering. You can drop that connection card in there. Uh, if you're a regular tender or a member and uh, you've not yet downloaded our Church Center app, I encourage you to do that. Uh, that's how you can find real-time updates, sign up for events, fill out your connection card, and really connect to all things Ridgeview. And so I encourage you, uh, download that app if you haven't yet. If you have it, go ahead and fill out your connection card uh, electronically. I want to draw your attention to just a, a few things uh, as we get rolling. Uh, in your program, uh, first off, you'll see a listening guide. I was in first service, and so I, I have some notes, but uh, Matt Sturdivant, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, is going to be speaking to us from God's Word. And the listening guide is here every week, really as a guide for you so you can see the Scriptures for yourself. You can take notes on what God is speaking to you about. And when you take notes, it actually helps you learn and remember. There's something about the pen uh, on the page. And if you're like me, it's also just relearning how to actually write, right? It's like I type so much, but when I write, there's something in my brain where it's like, okay, this, this, this actually helps. And so I encourage you to, to take notes this morning, and so you'll want to draw your attention to that. Uh, there's also on the, the backside or the flap, you'll see uh, just different events that we have coming up. We have uh, some ways to connect uh, for, for kids and moms, park days, uh, a park meetup, and you'll check those out. You know, please uh, RSVP, and you'll see other events on there. Uh, we usually on a Sunday don't take all the time to go through each event, but we do these events on purpose. Uh, we do them so you can really connect uh, with others within the church. That happens outside of just the Sunday, and we also do these events and different activities that to help you grow. 
And one of the things that we have that's a key event coming up is our, our Lord's Supper, or you may have heard of it as called communion. And we're going to be having this uh, remembrance and celebration coming up on April 2nd, uh, the week before Easter. Uh, for Easter, we, we celebrate the fact that, just like that song, we have a victory because Jesus has risen from the grave. But at the Lord's Supper, we actually remember that sacrifice that he made on our behalf. Uh, you have a lot going on in your life. I have a lot going on in my life. And it's easy to get so caught in the details that we actually have to pause. If you're a follower of Christ, you need to pause to remember all that Jesus has done for you. And as you remember the sacrifice he made, you're really filled with this gratitude. And so here at Ridgeview, we actually take time to be out of focus, to worship. Uh, we also spend time asking the question, is there anything in my relationship with God that I need to make right? Is there a distance? Is there a sin that I need to confess so that our relationship can be restored? And we ask God to speak to us in that way. And just like that can happen with our relationship with God, that can happen with our relationship with others as well. And so we take the time in the Lord's Supper to actually ask the question too, is there any relationships here within this church that there's some conflict or maybe there's some, some just reconciliation that needs to happen? And so here at Ridgeview, we take scripture, literally, we wanna stop, we wanna pause, we wanna make our relationships right. We wanna clear those up together. And so I encourage you, if you're a follower of Christ, uh, RSVP for that Lord's Supper. I think it will be a benefit to you and it will really gear us up uh, for this Easter season as we remember all that Christ has done. So speaking of Easter, everyone, if you can, go ahead and grab this flyer, hold it up, just wave it, do a little fan here. That way I know you got it. Helpful to think in terms of um, put it in your fingertips. Now, these flyers, every week we have a lot of flyers. They're not coasters. I didn't know if you knew that. We don't just give them so you don't like ruin the wood of your coffee table. Uh, these are actually meant for you to, to hand out. And this time of year, I don't know if you knew this, but because of Easter and times like uh, Christmas, you know, there's maybe that, that joke, like people show up like twice a year to church. Well, something happens around this type of year where, where people's hearts are actually softened to the things of God. They're actually asking questions. And I think God moves in our cities and in the different countries of the world to draw people to himself. And so Easter is our opportunity to look at the relationships that we have in our neighborhoods, in our families, at the workplace, and look around and see there's people that God has put in my life that are just crying out for help. And they're crying out for just hope and, and like a reason for them to live. And people are inundated with, with trials and anxiety. And on Easter Sunday, I'm gonna be launching a new series called From Terror to Triumph. And I believe in our city and in our country, people are just devastated by the terror that they're seeing. Maybe it's in the mirror, maybe it's within their head, maybe it's in the community and they're, they're, they're scared and anxious. But we have the triumph ultimately in Jesus. And people are desperate to know that there is a victory, that there is help. And so on Easter Sunday, I just encourage you, there's people in your life that God wants you to invite to come and experience the Easter celebration, the fact that we have hope in Jesus. And so if you can, write a name down of somebody that you can invite, or just ask the question, I don't know who I can invite, God, like, well, help me to know, and just begin to pray that God will show you who you can invite, and that he will give you the courage to actually do that. And so we'll have flyers in the program each week leading up to Easter. There's also a lot of flyers on the back table. If there's more people that you want to invite, I encourage you, grab a flyer and invite them. And that will be a blessing as you see God work and open doors. And so if you could commit to that, I can't wait to see what God does at our church this Easter. At this time, I want to invite a Pastor Matt Sturdivant from Hope Church. And Matt, you can come on out. Let's give him a hand. I want to just give a, a, a brief introduction for Matt, and he's going to share from God's Word and just some lessons that he has learned. And we're continuing in the series uh, from True to Real, and he's going to be walking through uh, how he's learned lessons that have moved from this, this category of, of truth to real. And I, I know you're going to want to pay attention and lean into that. It's, it's great stuff that he's going to share. Uh, but I want to speak uh, before he does just of the importance that we have and the blessing that we have as a church that we, we do not stand alone as a church. We have churches like Hope Church in Fort Worth, Texas and in our network that have helped us greatly. And I talked about us supporting the connection ministry in our Christmas offering. And Hope Church, really for the last six years, have supported Ridgeview Church in their Christmas offering. And we really stand not as a church that's just alone trying to figure this out, but we stand really with our partners like Hope Church, and we stand with the Connection Ministry. And so uh, you don't know Matt, probably, if you've never met him before, but Hope Church has been rallying behind us for years and praying for us and supporting us and really doing what is helpful for us to keep moving forward. And so as Matt shares, he is really a part 
of our family here at Ridgeview Church. So Matt, we're so glad to have you share with us. All right, thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to be here uh, this weekend, getting to participate in the Men's Summit with some guys uh, from Hope, getting to be here with you all this morning. Uh, I've known Alex for probably around 20 years now, and uh, we have never lived in the same state while we've been friends, but I consider Alex one of my dearest friends, a true brother in Christ, and maybe you're wondering, well, how can you have such a dear friend if you've never lived in the same state in the last 20 years? And it's because Alex and I have had so many experiences together over the years. Uh, maybe we could call them adventures. Uh, I just thought of one while I was backstage. You remember uh, we experienced a hurricane together in Orlando. We went out there for a conference, and all of a sudden a hurricane came. Hurricane Matthew of all the hurricanes. <laughs> And uh, like our quote from that trip was, you ever been in a hot tub in a hurricane? Because they locked the hotel down and we just, it wasn't the trip we were planning. But then we went water skiing afterwards in the, the back tropical storm after the hurricane passed through. So adventures like that. But probably the one that was the most formative for me uh, actually happened about 10 years ago. And I, I did not plan this. This just like is a God thing. 10 years ago, uh, we sent two teams uh, to Germany. And uh, we sent a team to Bonn, Germany uh, that Alex and his wife led. And that was, I think, right around the time that Anya was starting the campus there in Bonn. And then my wife and I led a team to Braunschweig. And then we linked up in the middle uh, for a retreat, a student retreat. So this is the picture of all of the uh, these are all Antioch students. Many, I think all of them have graduated now, and many of them are in ministry at different places uh, around the country. But uh, this, this was uh, that trip. Then here's a picture of Alex and I. Uh, so this was younger Alex and I. Uh, Alex was the, the, the keynote speaker. I think I was telling a story or hosting or doing something like that. Uh, but then my favorite picture of all that Alex and I have is this one. And we, we call this the album cover. This, this was this little train station that wasn't much. I mean, it was just a place that you got on the train. And uh, we, we, there were no trains around, so nobody was injured in the making of this photo. But we went out there and we set the tracks. And now I'm not musically inclined at all. Uh, so uh, if we had a band, though, this would be our album cover. And then after a lot of what we did with the mission, uh, my wife and I and Alex and Sam got to stay a little bit longer. We toured around. We got to go to the Vartburg Castle uh, where Martin Luther translated the New Testament. And uh, this was a, a picture of the four of us in one of the hallways uh, of, of the castle there. And then I got to be here in 2019. I brought a team from Hope to help with the grand opening. So it's fun to be here now a few years later. You guys are meeting in a different place. You have grown two services. That was just one service there for that grand opening. So it's really fun to be here. Uh, this morning, what I want to do is I just want to briefly share from my own journey, uh, some things from my story, uh, some, some things that God has taught me along the way. And I hope to encourage you and also maybe challenge you as I share some things from my story. I've been in ministry now for over 17 years, and, and what I've discovered is some of the things God's taught me, uh, although I have my own unique story, I have not learned just unique lessons that were for me. There's some patterns of some things that we, that we all experience. And one of those things is, is just the fact that life is a journey. It's, it's a journey while we're here on this planet. We start that journey on the day that we're born, Along the way, we make some stops, some temporary stops, and then we move on, and, and the journey continues uh, until we reach our final destination, until we leave this planet and we enter into eternity. So I want to start this morning with a maybe a more heavy question than uh, what you might be accustomed to this early in the morning. I don't know how much coffee you've already had, but here's the question. What do you want your life to be about? Just a small question, right? When you're no longer on this planet, when you're gone years later, what kinds of things do you want people to have remembered you for? What kinds of things do you want people saying about you years and years after you're no longer here? And again, maybe this is something you've thought about and you're like, I know my answer. I already got it. 
Maybe you've never thought about that up to this point. So I want to give you just 10 seconds to think about that now. What do you want your life to be about? Play some Jeopardy music or something here. Figuring out your entire life in 10 seconds. Now, I know that is not enough time to really do it justice. If you haven't thought about that, I want to invite you to continue to think about it. It's actually something I've thought quite a bit about. And I had a season probably between about 38 and 41 where I was just really thinking a lot about that. What do I want my life to be about? What do I want to be known for? And as I was thinking about that and praying about that, I found a passage of Scripture that really sort of summarizes what I want that to be for me. And this is from Acts 13, 36. And it says, For David, after he had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep and laid with his fathers. I mean, isn't that just a wonderful picture of you serve God's purposes and then it's over? And, and that's really what I want my life to be about. I want to be remembered for serving God's purposes in my own generation. A few verses before this, uh, it said that David was a man after God's own heart. So you could say when it comes to following God, David was someone who was all in. He was not perfect. He messed up a lot. But he was a man who was all in. And for me, when, when I'm long gone, 100 years from now, I will have had a successful life if People could say about me that I served God's purposes in my generation. Matt was all in. But here's the thing. I wasn't born with that picture of of my life. I wasn't born with that vision. It's not something that just uh, came in one day. It's been part of my journey of walking with Jesus for nearly 40 years now. And I, I, along that way, there's many things that I learned. And then I had to relearn some things. And then relearn some more things. And, but the more that I followed him, the more that my thoughts and my attitudes and my actions begin to align more with his. So less of me and, and more of him. And that's, that's part of the, the journey. I actually grew up here in Southern California. I was born in Fullerton. And then uh, we lived in Anaheim until I was eight. When I was eight, we made the the big drive up the hill to Yorba Linda. So anybody here from the YL? All right, sometimes when I'm speaking in Southern California, there's, there's always somebody and they'll, they'll flash me the YL sign, right? Uh, but Yorba Linda is not that far from Fontana. We got a map here in case you're, in case you're not familiar with it. Um, but I grew up in a Christian home. I'm the oldest of three kids. I've got a younger brother and then a younger sister. And I grew up going to church. I grew up with my parents talking about Jesus. Uh, I became a follower of, of Jesus when I was five years old. That, that's part of my story. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that that was part of the foundation of my story and, and getting to grow up in that environment. Between ages eight and 14, uh, I wasn't able to run, jump, or kick due to some procedures that I had regarding my hip. Then when I was 14 years old, I was run over by a drunk driver while inner tubing on a lake. At 19, I met and then several months later uh, began dating Jessica, who I eventually married after we finished school. Also at age 19, I was invited to uh, a, a, a young church start. And, I, and it was there that I met the pastor of that church and, and he began to uh, mentor me, began to disciple me, and what really was a catalyst in my spiritual growth starting at about age 19. Then as I moved into my 20s, at 23, I graduated from college. I got a business degree in marketing. We got married. We went on our honeymoon. We came back. We moved to Texas uh, to be a part of Hope Church. Thought I'd just be there for a few years, and then the idea of church Starting was interesting to me. We'll just be in Texas for a few years, start our career, start our family, and then we'll see where God takes us on the next adventure. At age 27, God called me out of the marketplace into vocational ministry, and I had an opportunity to join the staff at Hope Church. Then over the next 10 years, as I moved out of my 20s into my 30s, 
uh, God opened up all kinds of opportunities. I got to meet all kinds of people. I traveled around the world getting to do uh, different ministry things. While at the same time, I got to experience a lot of difficulties, a lot of hardships along the way. One of really the joy that I've had, a, a new adventure that started a little bit later uh, for, for me, and that was becoming a dad in my mid-30s. Uh, first to a baby girl in 2016, and then 19 months later, uh, the next summer to a boy. Here's a picture of us. Uh, this was, you know, the, the Christmas card picture uh, that we took back in December. And uh, Kenzie, she's seven now, and Kai is five and a half. And uh, just before, since her birthday's in January, it's not too far from Christmas. As an early birthday present, we went on a daddy-daughter date to go see the Nutcracker. So we got all dressed up and went to the Bass Performance Hall. And then uh, that's my son, Kai. He's five and a half. This was his first season of basketball. Now, he's, he's five years old, but he's the height of a seven-year-old. And I was having to restrain myself as dad, you know, out there, him playing basketball, like he should be dominating. And it's his very first time to play. But he really enjoyed it, so we're, we're excited. He did baseball in the spring, and, and then he told us after his first basketball game, I really like basketball more. And this next, this next Saturday, he's going to start soccer, so we'll see, uh, see what he likes there. But uh, th this, now that I'm in my 40s, I have gotten to experience more adventures and more difficulties, more challenges. You know, when you're in your 20s and there's things that are challenging, and then you get in your 30s and you find out what challenges are, and you look back and you say, oh, that was nothing. Then you're in your 40s and uh, you look back at your 30s and you say, that was nothing. So I'm a little bit terrified. I know many of you are, are older than me, and you can say, just wait, what's to come? And okay. But life is a journey, so part of that is God preparing us along the way for the next things in our journey that come ahead. So maybe you can relate to just a few of the things that I sh shared already about some of the challenges and the, the difficulties. What I want to do is I just want to share some lessons that I've learned as I've walked with Jesus. So obviously I'm not going to be able to share every single thing, but these are just sort of a, a summary of the, of the five big lessons that I've learned along the way. And, and these lessons have all been learned by experience. So I could show you the scars, both physical scars, and then I have emotional scars for some of these lessons that I, that I want to share with you. So the first one is this, is God loves me so much more than I can actually understand. And, I, and I'm using first person here. This is my story. God loves me so much more than I can understand. But let's stop here and say God loves you so much more than you can understand. I don't know if you've heard that. Maybe, that, maybe you've never heard that. I want, if you hear nothing else today, I want you to know God loves you. We are his creation. He, he made us in his image to have a relationship with us, to love us. And then we, his creation, we mess things up. But then he provided a way so that we could be reconciled back to him through his son, Jesus. And since I, I grew up in a Christian home, you know, I, I, uh, I started attending church nine months before I was born. And, and I remember hearing about Jesus and how much he loved me. And, and I, probably the very first verse that I ever memorized was John 3.16. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then 1 John 3.16 says, we know what love is because Christ died for us. So I, I grew up understanding that God loved me. I grew up understanding this. But then I, in my early years, I had some experiences that, that moved things from just an understanding up here, like, yeah, that's true, to this is real. I have experienced the reality of the truth of Scripture. So when I was eight years old, I, I developed this really painful limp. It, it progressed pretty quickly and went to the doctors, and I, I had a hip condition that was going to need some surgeries and some procedures to correct it. So I had the first l least evasive options. You know, that's where you want to start, right, when you're a kid. So I had cast on for about five months like this. Both legs, a bar in the middle. I actually, I could walk, kind of waddled like a duck, you know, 
And uh, I actually got pretty fast as an eight-year-old. You, can, you could go pretty fast like that with some practice. And that, that didn't quite solve it, though. So then I had some other surgeries where I couldn't walk for periods of three to five months at a time, and I was in a wheelchair. And, and through these experiences with having the casts on and the surgeries, I began to understand really the power of prayer, praying for God's help during difficult circumstances. And then in the spring of my eighth grade year, mind you, I have, I have not been able to run, jump, or kick since I was eight. In my spring of my eighth grade year, go in, the doctor's like, okay, you're clear. So I got, I got the doctor's note that doesn't say, no, you can't do PE. It was like, you're in. And it just happened to be that that was the Friday where at that time in junior high, every Friday you had to run laps around the field. I think it was kind of like the modern day form of torture for junior high students. But I was so excited. I gave that note to, uh, to, my doc, to, my, to the, the PE coach. And then I was like Forrest Gump. I was running, you know. And, and the, the coach yelled, start and slow down. You're going to kill yourself. And I ran for that first lap. And I think I crawled the rest of the, rest of the way because... Obviously, I didn't have the endurance to run, but I was so excited. Then just a few months later, graduated from eighth grade, getting ready to start high school, all of the hopes and dreams and all the things you want to do when you go into high school. My family and I took a weekend trip to Lake Havasu in Arizona. On that Saturday morning, we got up early with my, with my dad and my aunt and my uncle, and I got up on skis for the very first time. You know, early in the morning when the lake is like really smooth and glassy. And then we went on about our day. And then about 6 p.m. that evening, we were out inner tubing. And you fall off a tube. If you've ever, ever inner tubed, you know that's just what happens. That's part of the fun. But what wasn't normal was I was then run over by a drunk driver who wasn't paying attention. I was rushed to the emergency room there in, in Lake Havasu, and they said, oh, there's nothing we can do for you here. So I got to uh, ride in a medical transport plane from Lake Havasu to Phoenix to a trauma center. And, and I was there, and, I, and they, I came in with really severe injuries. I had a collapsed lung and, and a severed liver and lacerations all over my torso and my bicep and my hand, and I had lost nearly all of the blood in my body. Spent 10 days in the ICU, and then I was released from the hospital about three weeks after entering into it. And when we left the hospital that day, uh, the doctor said that when I came in that night, they had given me about a 30% chance to live. They had never seen anyone come in as bad as I did actually leave the hospital alive. So everything that I learned previously through this experience with the hips and relying on God and the power of prayer those things were magnified throughout this experience, really relying on God. In fact, getting to experience the power of, of literally hundreds of people around the country that I'll never get to meet who were praying for me as I went through that time. And one of the things that I, that I left that experience from and, and went into high school was I was entering into high school with no doubt in my mind that God is real. It's not only true, but He's real. And he loves me. And then after becoming a father, years later, I gained new perspective on 1 John 1, 3, where it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. You see, when we are forgiven, we also get to enter into God's family. And that's, there's a true to real moment when you become a father for the first time. I remember when my daughter was born the first time. This is a picture of my first time I got to hold her. And I'm, I'm looking at her, and I've just got so much love and affection for this little person that hasn't done anything. You know, she, she's just been born less than an hour later and, or before that. And, 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 and I think there's a reason why God doesn't allow babies to talk. Because as I looked at her, anything she'd asked me for, I would have done it. But she just looked back at me. So the first lesson is that God loves me so much more than I can actually understand. The second lesson is that God's absolutely 100% in control. Even if, from our perspective, it looks like things are totally out of control, we're headed for disaster, and we're not getting that thing that we want or that thing that we think we deserve, 
Anybody ever felt that way? I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting what I deserve. I, I, I got no control here. I don't know where this is going to end. But one of the major difficulties that my wife and I walked through in our 30s was having a season where we really wanted to start a family. We wanted to have children and, and that not being able to happen. See, we met in college. We got married right after college. We were young, so our plan at the time was we were going to be married for about five years and then start a family. Because after all, I mean, we're practically kids ourselves. So five years came and five years went, and then five years turned into 10 years. And we thought, well, we haven't had any kids yet. Then we decided to go to the doctor to investigate this. And I don't know if you've ever gone to a fertility doctor, but that's Kind of a humbling and a scary thing to go to the doctor to, to actually want to get some answers and see what's going on. After several months of investigation, uh, the doctor you know, calls us back and we're, we're sitting in his office and he looks at us and he says, I got good news and I got bad news. Doctor, any doctors ever told you that? I got good news and bad news. And, and he says, the good news is there's nothing wrong with you. You're medically fine. Everything checks out. So, like, so what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is you fall into this very small percentage of unexplained infertility. So we left the doctor's office that day, and it was a really hard thing to hear, not the answers we were wanting to hear. But we left with a, with a sense of, of God really saying, the only reason you haven't gotten pregnant is because I haven't allowed it to happen. He didn't tell us it's going to happen, but he made it very clear that this was something that he was withholding for whatever reason. So that was really hard to hear, but in that same moment, God reminded me of my call into ministry, and part of that was I wanted to have the most impact that I could, the most earthly impact for the kingdom. So my wife and I were in our mid-30s. We've had some experiences. We knew some things. We weren't just kids anymore. And we said, okay, we're going to go all in. We're going to go all into ministry. I was on staff. She was also on staff at the church. And God opened up doors for us to travel around the world. I can't even tell you how many times I've been to Germany and other places in Europe with Connection Ministry. I, mean, I need like a, like a frequent flyer stamp on my passport or something opened up all kinds of opportunities to travel and be a part of things that he was doing to train people to advance the kingdom. And then when we least expected it, in the middle of a really, really busy season, we discovered that we were pregnant in May of 2015. And then our daughter was born in January of the next year. We celebrated our 14th wedding anniversary on January 4th, and then on January 7th, our daughter was born. So a few years after our plan, but that was when God gave us children. And some, some verses that have been really important for me along the way, one of them was Psalm 103, 19. It says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. God rules over all, even the things that we, we can't see, we can't understand. God is ruling even if it looks like life is out of control. And I'm not going to read this one, but in, in late in Genesis, after Joseph is reunited with his brothers and having this conversation, and Joseph tells his brothers, hey, this thing happened, but God let it happen. Yes, his brother's sin was involved, but God actually orchestrated things through some really hard things for Joseph to be in the right position to do the things that God had for him to do in the midst of this plague or, or the, the famine that was going to come. So God is 100% in control. We waited 14 years for our first child, and then 19 months later, God gave us a son. And this is one of my favorite pictures of my son. It's, it's, it's you know, you can see it's, he's just a little guy there, but he, he was such a smiley, joyful baby. And this is one of those like baby walker things that so we put him in this, and this was like his vehicle to move all around the house. And he just, you'd be in one room and he'd come sliding in with this big smile. And so God, God ultimately gave us the things that we were longing for. It was the long route for that. The, the next lesson is life 
is God's training program for me. Which means life, your life, is God's training program for you. And this, this training program, is, it's a required course. It's not an elective. We can't skip out on this one. We all share similar experiences, but then we also have different parts to our story, different experiences, and we, we, God takes us through hard things. And what I found is that hard thing was usually to help prepare me for the next hard thing. So God uses what we go through in life to train us. And, and I think sometimes we wrongly assume and we wrongly think, well, I'm going to follow Jesus and then I'm going to be on the easy road. Everything's going to be great. You see, when you follow Jesus, you're not sort of coated with Teflon where things just bounce off of you. It's really, uh, following Jesus is not about the absence of problems, but it's about the presence of having the help and the resources that you need to get through the problems. Those things that I walked through, they're very difficult in my childhood and my teen years, and the difficult things that I've walked through in my 20s and my 30s. They're all part of my story. They're all the things that God has used me to be the man that I am today. And I know that I wouldn't be who I am had I not gone through those things. And I wouldn't wish for anyone to go through what I have been through. But it's not been wasted. I am who I am today as a result and part of God taking me through those experiences. James 1, 2 2 through 4 says, Dear brothers, Is your life full of difficulties and temptations? Then be happy, for when the way is rough, your patience has a chance to grow. So let it grow, and don't try to squirm out of your problems. Isn't that a great picture? Isn't that what we try to do? We we, we face a problem, something hard, and we just want to squirm out of it and get back to the good life. It says, for when your patience is finally in full bloom, then you will be ready for anything strong in character, full and complete. And then Romans 5, 3, and 4 says, More than that, we're to rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. These verses were encouraging to me as I walked through hard things because it told me that there was a purpose in the pain. God was using this to grow me and developing me into the person he wants me to ultimately be so that he can do the things through my life that he wants to do. I couldn't have done several things that I have done in my life had I not walked through some of those difficult things before that. The next lesson is that as I pick my friends, I pick my future. This is really true about our friends. In fact, unless you're intentionally picking people in life that are going to call you forward and build you up, they're going to eventually tear you down. And some of you, part of your story is You say, yeah, I got in with the wrong crowd when I was in junior high or high school, and it took me years of pain to get out of some of that. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. By the way, if you're ever reading Scripture and you see that phrase, don't be deceived, pay close attention, because they're usually things that we're easily deceived by. Then Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with the wise men becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Hang out with fools. You're going to start doing foolish things. You're going to experience the pain of that. I found this fascinating quote several years ago in a book about friendship. It says this, Each of our friends has contributed to the person we have become. But friends mark us in profound ways. They alter our thinking actions, desires, and ambitions for good or bad. So as I'm picking my friends, I'm picking my future. As I'm picking my friends, I'm picking my thoughts and my actions and my desires and my ambitions and those good things that I do or those foolish things that I do. Then entrepreneur and author Jim Rohn, he says it this way. He says, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So here's another question you can contemplate. Who are you the average of? Who are those that you're spending the most time with? So I'm so grateful that I met Jessica that first semester of college and that we started dating at the end of our first year. I'm so grateful that she invited me to attend a small new church start in Huntington Beach, California. And as a result of that, I met the pastor there. His name is Thad King. Some of you know Thad. I'm so grateful that Thad took the time and had the patience 
to mentor me and to disciple me and help me really understand what does it mean to walk with Jesus. And then years later, I'm so grateful that I was able to meet guys like Randy Lanthrop and Bevan Unruh and Josh De La Rosa and Alex Barrett. And today, as a result of that, I have the awesome privilege to stand here and speak to you all. People gathered not that far away from where I grew up, but I would have no idea that Ridgeview Church was here and that you all were here had I not walked down the path that God had for me and picked the friends that I picked that had an influence in my life. This is true for us at an individual level, but it's also true at an organizational level. Ridgeview Church and Hope Church, as Alex mentioned, we're part of a network of churches, the 17-6 network. And the network's vision is to see life-changing churches multiply around the cities of the world. And we've been able to collaborate and work together for all kinds of training and missions experiences. There's a couple of photos here of some mission teams that went out uh, from our North Star training grads and from our Antioch Project students. And here's the way I like to think about this. As a finger, you can only do so much, right? I could walk up to the wall and I could, I could poke on the wall until my finger was broken. But you take that finger and you, you wrap it with some others and you make a fist. And then as a fist, you can have a much greater impact. You could punch through that wall if you needed to. So as I pick my friends, I'm picking my future and The last lesson is this, is that walking with Jesus on this side of eternity is is a journey made one step at a time. You can only take one step at a time. A couple years ago, I had an opportunity to go to Guatemala. One of my previous roles was as mission pastor, so I've traveled all over the world. We were in Guatemala. This was the most wonderful and the most difficult experience of my life, trekking through the jungle. We did 20 miles in two days. And part of the road looked like this. This was probably a really good road for where we were. It was paved, sort of. We were walking downhill. I didn't know we were going to have to walk back up this. That was a little more challenging. But then this next picture... This is what most of trekking through the jungle looked like. So I'm standing in the same place for this picture. You can see there's the path behind us that we've just come up, and the next picture is looking forward, what we're going to go up. And this is what most of these 20 miles that we trekked through looked like. There were some really hard steps, and then there were some really, really, really hard steps that we had to take along the way. And that's part of what it's like walking with Jesus and taking next steps. One of those things is we just have to obey. John 14, 20 says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. How do we love Jesus? We obey him. We don't just say, Jesus, I love you, and then do whatever we want or feel. We show our obedience, our love by obeying. And I want to come full circle to what we looked at when we started. Because all throughout the Bible, you see examples of men and women who were faced with very difficult circumstances, and they were faced with having to trust God and taking steps. One of those is David. We looked at the end of what was said after his life was done, but David, at a young man, he was anointed to be the next king of Israel. Took him eight years to be king over part of it, and then another seven to be king over the whole kingdom. During that time, he had some difficult steps to take. In fact, I did a rough estimate that you know, they didn't have cars back then, so they walked a lot more. In that time, from when David was anointed to be king to when he became king, my conservative estimate is he had 29 million steps that he took. 29 million steps from when you know you're going to do this thing that God has told you you're going to do to when it actually happens. And he was promised by God. He he was anointed to be the next king. It was 29 million steps. Fighting Goliath and having to run from King Saul. 
So as you read through the scriptures, though, what you find are men and women who they, they took those steps. Sometimes they were big steps, sometimes they were small steps, but they took those steps. And regardless of the size of the step, God provided the strength and the courage and the resources that they needed to take the next step. So that's my challenge to you today, is take the next step. We all have different next steps. We're all at different places in our own journeys with Jesus. Some of you have been walking with Jesus for a long time. Others of you have just recently started walking with him. And some of you are here today exploring. What does it mean to follow Jesus? So I want to invite you to take the next step. Because as we move forward in life, we take one step, then we take another, and then we take another. So maybe your next step is just to come back next week. Maybe you're here for the very first time and you were hoping to get to hear from the pastor of Ridgeview Church and you got to hear from me instead. So come back next week to hear from Alex. Or maybe God wants you to take a a deeper step of commitment. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what your next step is, but I know that each one of us has a next step to take. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you that you have allowed each one of us to intersect here this morning in our journey. We're on our own individual journeys, but we're here this morning. You have allowed us to walk through different experiences in our life. I pray that you would show us what the next step is that you have for us. Sent Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Thank you that we can be reconciled to you. Please, Father, show us our next steps and then give us the courage to take them. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, in just a few moments, we're going to receive this morning's offering. I just want to draw your attention back to that connection card that we mentioned earlier. Uh, You can scan the QR code. That'll take you uh, to anything Ridgeview related, really. And you can sign up for things there. But you can also just fill out that bottom portion, tear it off, and put it in the offering as it goes by. Um, You'll also see up here on the screen there's three ways to give. Um, If you're new to Ridgeview, again, we'd love to meet you after service. Uh, Members of our staff will be at the next step area uh, in the back of the room. Um, But also, if you're you're new, don't feel pressured to give uh, in any way this morning. We're fully supported by our members and regular tenders, and and we're grateful for them and for God uh, keeping us on mission. And so, ushers, you guys can come forward. We're going to receive this morning's offering. stand. We're going to close singing one song back to God this morning.
can all come to Because they can't stay long When I am here with you It's a new horizon And I'm set on you And you meet me here today With mercy and love While my fears and doubts slow yeah, They can all come to Because they can't stay long